we talked about a few yesterday, and so what we'll do is uh, we'll kind of review those. Um, Emma, if you can tell me what the first Mercury flight was called, please. Freedom 7. Haley, can you tell me what type of flight that was? There's two different types of flights. What type of flight was it? What's that? It was, an orbital means it would have went all the way around the world. So, so if it didn't go all the way around the world, what would it be? Suborbital sub flight. Who commanded that, Mauricio? Who commanded Freedom 7? Alan, Al Alan Shepard Jr. How long was he in space, Alex? Or Approximately. 15 About 15 minutes. <coughs> he went 117 miles into space. Uh, dropped down about uh, 15 minutes later, and his flight went down history as the Shepherd's Prayer flight. We talked about that. Okay, what was the second flight, Allison? Um, Liberty Bell 7. Liberty Bell 7? <coughs> Excuse me. Emery, what type of flight was it? It was a suborbital also. And Braden, who commanded that flight? That was... Virgil Gus Chrisom. And kind of explain, compare that flight, if you would, Callie, to Shepard's flight. Just a small comparison. Um, he went 118 miles, so 130 miles. So he went, yeah, one more mile in space at about the same thing. What was the unusual thing, though, Hannah, a vigil that happened to him on, on his return home? He was and how did that happen? The, the, the uh, skate patch accidentally came out uh, and it filled with water and he was rescued by a helicopter uh, and nearly drowned. Unfortunately, he didn't. He had another very close call which turned out not as well because what happened to him on the Apollo 1 mission, Aubrey, that happened in 67? They burned to death because they had an experimental uh, <coughs> test on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy and the fire started and the burn all three astronauts killed them all. So he was killed then. Okay, how about the third flight there, uh, Carmen? It was Friendship 7. Friendship 7. Probably the most famous. Why, Glenn? Um, because it was an orbital flight. It was an orbital flight. Who commanded that, Sadria? Um, John Glenn Jr. He became the first American to orbit the Earth, but he wasn't the first person. Who was the first person to orbit the Earth, Mary? Um, He's a cosmonaut. Uh, <coughs> what was his name? Yuri Gagarin. Very good, Yuri Gagarin. And the great thing about this flight is that the success of his flight helped overcome our fears, and we actually thought we were kind of winning the race for space, which was great. Um, we did then mention, and Brianna picked this up, which was great, that Glenn never flew again until he was in his 70s. He was grounded by President Kennedy because he did not, not want his new, hero, his new hero to be killed in the space program, because this was a very risky business they were in. It was not an easy thing to do. Okay, that'll take us to our next flight, I believe, isn't it? And this flight was Aurora 7. Aurora 7. A-U-R-O-R-A. -R -R -A. It occurred on May 24, 1962. Aurora 7. May 24, 1962. And this particular mission was commanded by Scott Carpenter. And Scott Carpenter, did we talk about this one yesterday? No. Okay. This is Scott Carpenter right here. Okay, Aurora 7, Scott Carpenter. So he becomes the second American to orbit the Earth because this is also an orbital flight. And how many times do you remember did Glenn circle the Earth? Three. Three. Carpenter did the same thing, but he did something that Glenn didn't. He took photographs of the Earth from space. So they were the first photographs that we had ever had from space. So 
On May 24, 1962, 1962 <coughs> Scott Carpenter commanded Aurora 7. He becomes the second American to orbit the Earth. He circles the Earth three times and he photographed the Earth from space. He also became the first American astronaut and first person in the world to eat solid food in space. To eat solid food in space. He was the first astronaut to eat solid food in space. Now he had a little problem during landing also. His spacecraft landed more than 200 miles off target in the ocean. So he was like 200 miles away from the rescue vessel that was to bring him to safety. So he landed about more than 200 miles off target. And he actually lost contact with recovery forces for over an hour before they found him. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? One of these little small capsules, who frankly, which frankly could probably sink at any time. I mean, these things were not made to be in the ocean for any large, long period of time, not even an hour. So he had lost contact with the recovery forces after he landed 200 miles off target, and finally he was found. Now, what branch of the military was he? Anybody remember? Navy. And you know what he did was kind of interesting. In 1965, he took a leave of absence from the Mercury Space Program, and he became an aquanaut. Anybody know what an aquanaut is? <coughs> Kind of like a space explorer that takes special training, only where you exploring, you're not exploring the space, ocean. you're exploring the ocean. So he took time off in 1967 to become an aquanaut. It was a new program where they did real deep sea research. 1965 is when he took the leave of absence and he became an aquanaut. It was a new program that the uh, Navy was putting on. Well, he liked that so much, he resigned from NASA in 1967 and continued his career in the Navy until 1969 when he suffered leg injuries that forced him to retire. So he resigned from NASA in 1967 to continue his work for the Navy. He, he received leg injuries, kind of like a football player does throughout his life. And finally, in 1969, they were too much, and he retired from the Navy in 1969. <coughs> he led a really nice life after his retirement. He lived until the age of 88 when he died from a stroke in 2013. So he just died recently. So he lived a really nice life after retirement. He ended up dying at the age of 88 from a stroke in 2013. That would be Scott Carpenter. Okay, our next flight was called Sigma 7. Sigma 7. Sigma 7. And it was commanded by Walter Sharara Jr. and occurred on October 3rd, 1962. Sigma 7. <coughs> commanded by Walter Sharara Jr. And it occurred on October 3rd, 1962. And his mission was similar to Glenn's and Carpenter's. He became the third American, obviously, to orbit the Earth, but he circled the globe six times. He went around six times. So his mission was very similar except for he extended the number of times that he went around the earth from three to six, Walter Sharara Jr. Now he was quite a pilot. He, uh, he flew 90 combat missions in Korea, in the Korean War, before being chosen as a Mercury astronaut. What are the chances of you surviving 90 combat missions? I mean, that's pretty amazing that he even survived that. So he flew 90 combat missions in the Korean War prior to even being, becoming an astronaut in the Mercury Project. He also continued his space career. He served in both the Gemini and Apollo programs. So he was in the Mercury space program, the Gemini space program, and the Apollo 
space program. He served in all three. And he got real lucky on Apollo 7. He flew in Apollo 7, got really lucky. How do you think he got lucky? Did he almost die? No, he got perhaps what might have been the most famous cold in NASA history. Uh, probably the most famous cold while he was up in space in NASA history. Got a very famous cold when he was in flight. Anybody know what that is? The day of the flight? One more time. The day of sequence. Oh, October 3rd, 1962. Anybody heard of that? What is that? Anybody know what the ActiFed is? You're too young. It's a remedy for what? To get cold, you take some ActiFed. Help you get over your cold. So guess what he took in space? And guess what happened to him when he got back on Earth? What? What'd you say? What'd she say? He threw up? No, blew up. <laughs> he, blew, he blew up financially. He became the lead spokesman for ActiFed and made a lot of money. So, Walter Schrara Jr. on the Apollo 7 flight after his Mercury and Gemini career caught was what was perhaps the most famous cold in NASA history. And he took ActiFed to relieve his symptoms in space and he became the lead spokesman for the drug. He appeared in many commercials advertising the project product and made a lot of money. So he really profited from that cold. He retired. He was a Navy pilot, also retired in 1969. And he died in 2007 of a heart attack. And his ashes were committed to the sea. Very good. So he retired from the Navy in 1969, passed away in 2007 of a heart attack, and his ashes were committed to the sea. And we'll talk about our final flight, which means somebody doesn't get a fly here. Because this is our sixth one, right? Somebody didn't get a chance to fly. We'll see who it is. The final flight was called Faith 7. Faith 7. And the difference between Faith 7 and the rest is it occurred on May 15th and 16th, 1963. So it was a two-day flight. So, May 15th and 16th, 1963, Faith 7. So, it either has to be commanded by one of two men. Who's left? Anybody can keep track? Gordon. Gordon Cooper Jr.'s left and Donald, Donald Deke Slayton. Well, this, unfortunately, for Donald Deke Slayton, was commanded by Gordon Cooper Jr. It was commanded by Gordon Cooper Jr. Now there's a couple of significances about this flight, other than the fact it was two days, is it was, he orbited the Earth 22 times. And it would also become the last solo flight in space history. What's that mean? One person. Okay, so May 15th and 16th, 1963, Faith 7, commanded by Gordon Cooper Jr. He orbited the Earth 22 times during those two days in what became the last solo flight in space history. Now his two days, he logged more time in those two days than all the other five Mercury flights together. Okay, he was in space 34 hours, 19 minutes, and 49 seconds. So he logged more time on this one flight than all the other Mercury flights combined. He was in space 34 hours, 19 minutes and 49 seconds. Now, I'll repeat that. 34 hours, 19 minutes and 49 seconds. Um, what was the rate of speed that Alan Shepard accumulated in Freedom 7? How many miles an hour? Remember? 5,000. Okay, it's around 5,000. In this particular flight, Cooper went 17,547 miles per hour. 17,000. 547 miles per hour, traveling 34 hours, 19 minutes, and 49 seconds, traveling 17,547 miles an hour. 
So that was pretty successful. Now two years later, two years later he flew as a command pilot of Gemini 5. That was the next space program was Gemini. So two years after this famous flight of Faith 7 in the Mercury Project, he flew as command pilot of Gemini 5, which was an eight-day, 120-orbit mission. So two years later, he flew as command pilot of Gemini 5, which was, a, which was an eight-day, 120-orbit mission. And he must have flown with somebody, right? Flew with a guy by the name of Pete Conrad, for what it's worth. Pete Conrad was his partner in that flight, Gemini 5. Okay, how many have seen the movie Apollo 13, or know about it? Okay, that, that was Tom Hanks starred in that, and basically they were going up to land on the moon, and they had issues, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is interesting. Cooper actually was the first choice to command Apollo 13. He was their first choice instead of, G instead of Jim Lovell. Well, he got had a kind of a falling out with NASA management, and so they overlooked him and chose Alan Shepard instead. So, again, this is kind of interesting. Gordon Cooper Jr. was the man that was to be commanding Apollo 13, that ill-fated flight. They got into a little bit of a disagreement with the officials at NASA, so they basically took it away from him and gave it to Alan Shepard Jr. Well, what Shepard did, let's look back at him. He flew our first one, did he not? Okay, what, do you remember what he did? What did he, when did he retire? Nineteen seventy-four, right? So who got the assignment after Shepard retired? Jim Lovell. And that's the guy that ended up flying Apollo 13. Okay? Now Cooper. What Jim Lovell. Jim, you'll talk about him later. But Jim, J, uh, James Lovell was the guy that you see in the movie. Apollo 13. Tom Hanks played him in that movie. But he was like the third choice, is what I, the point I'm making. Maybe that was saying something. Uh, Cooper retired from NASA in 1970. He entered private business, did quite well in private business. And he died in 2004 at the age of 77. So he resigned from NASA in 1970, entered private business, did very well in the private business world, and eventually died in 2004 at the age of 77. He was cremated, and guess where his ashes were sent? In the space. In the space. That's right. One of the missions took his ashes up, and they were sent into orbit around the Earth. That was Gordon Cooper, Jr. He died in 2004 at the age of 77. So who's that leave us? Who'd that leave us? Don, Donald Deek Slate. I'll tell you just a little bit about him. Obviously, he never flew. You know why? He had an erratic heartbeat. They were scheduled to have another mission, and because he had an erratic, uh, an erratic heartbeat, they grounded it. So they just bagged it and went on to what? Gemini. Gemini, thank you. Now, if you talk about Apollo 13, what did I do with that picture? Gene Krantz was the guy that Ed Harris played in that movie with the fancy white vest, if you ever watched it. But the guy that was the director of flight crew operations, the guy that was responsible, the chief astronaut on the ground during Apollo 13 was Deke Slayton. He was the guy, and you'll see him in the movie if you watch it, he was the guy that directed the entire Apollo 13 operation. So that was his job. He retired, Slate retired from NASA in 1982. <coughs> Worked in the space industry for about 10 years. Retired and moved to Texas in 1992. Retired from NASA in 1982. Worked in and out for 10 years in the space industry. 
and retired and moved to Texas in 1992. And unfortunately, he was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor and died in 1993. Okay? He moved to Texas in 92 and was diagnosed with a brain tumor and died in 1993. Okay, any questions on the Mercury flights? Okay, and we'll talk about what you'll need to know there. I want to show you something here, though. Uh, you know, I'm into these signatures, so I got pretty lucky. I got a Donald Geek Slayton. I think I paid about 50 bucks for it. Then this Scott Carpenter cost me about 70. You cannot get a Virgil Gus Grissom. You can look on eBay and see what those are selling for. I was bidding on one the other day. I was bidding on one the other day, and it got up to 750 bucks, and I begged that I wasn't. I was going to play pay near that. I did win a Walter Sharara Jr. yesterday for 45 bucks. But here's a. This is a Mercury Seven, uh, what they call first issue stamp, and you see a lot of these around here, and what they are is like the first time that this stamp came out with John Kennedy, they send out a first edition stamp where it's kind of a big deal where you go to the post office and buy one of those. Here's a first edition stamp of, a, of the stamp that commemorated the Mercury Project, signed by all seven astronauts. You can buy it today for $4,999.99 if you would like that. Okay? So, What's the, mo what's the most important signatures on these, if you're into autographs, aren't so much, you might be able to buy a Scott Carpenter, he signed a lot. Who didn't sign much, obviously? Gus Grissom, because his signature is very rare. So what makes this worth so much is the person that doesn't sign a lot. Now, obviously when somebody passes away they don't sign anymore, so they look back at the, at the research on how much they signed when they were alive. And, Gus Grissom didn't sign much, so I don't know if we'll ever get one of those. That just gives, goes to tell you what history's worth a little bit, okay? We'll go into our last subtopic, and I kind of like these. They're kind of fun. We take a year in history and tell you some off 